The workforce development challenges have been an issue in many of the heavy equipment and vehicle industries our publications cover for years, and the COVID-19 pandemic has further emphasized these challenges. A recent survey conducted by the Association of Equipment Manufacturers of high-level executives at the off-road equipment manufacturers found that employee health and well-being, lack of new orders, and continued supply chain challenges are some of the biggest issues they're currently facing as they reopen their facilities, and that the COVID-19 pandemic is taking its toll on the industry's workforce. More than one-third of respondents said they have furloughed up to half of their employees, while roughly one in five of respondents indicated that they have laid off as many as 10% of their workforce. The road to recovery is lined with warning signs, the survey went on to say, with equipment manufacturers who have furloughed workers, Nearly a third of them said that they would not bring anyone back to work. And for those who've laid off workers, eight out of 10 said that they will not rehire them based on current market conditions and challenges. So I don't know, Becky, what have you been hearing? The construction industry was a little bit different than the manufacturing sector because of the essential designation for construction in a number of areas. So work continued throughout the COVID shutdown, albeit at a slower pace than what has typically been seen. And now we're starting to see that workforce demand slowly build back up as the economy has started to open up and construction projects have started to get their momentum back. But there's a lot of uncertainty about where the workforce that will do those jobs are, is going to come from. A quote from Patrick Ryan at the multinational construction consultancy firm Mindsight indicates that not all workers are coming back due to concerns over the risk of infection, competing responsibilities at home, and in some cases, their reliance on enhanced unemployment benefits under the CARES Act. He says the long-lasting impact of project delays due to pandemic shutdowns, as well as new safety regulations that limit the number of on-site personnel, will further reduce the pool of available workers. There is a big risk there that we will see the industry start to recover, but that the workforce will struggle to come back to where it was. We saw that after the Great Recession, where a number of workers ended up moving into other industries rather than coming back into construction due to the uncertainty. And then there's also the aging workforce. Uh, the average age of U.S. construction workers is somewhere between 45 to 55 years old. And due to COVID-19, obviously older workers are more susceptible. And so a percentage of these workers may choose to simply opt out to time out and start their retirement early because of the situation. And that's going to take their skills out of the marketplace and exacerbate that skills gap that we've already been seeing prior to the pandemic. So there's a lot of challenges out there, certainly. Yeah, we're hearing much the same retirement is also an issue for employees in the manufacturing sector, as is just attracting new younger workers. I recently spoke with Julie Davis, Workforce Development Director at the Association of Equipment Manufacturers, who noted these issues and play a brief clip of that interview now. So what are some of the biggest challenges AEM is seeing currently within the off-road equipment manufacturing industry? So your timing of asking this question is perfect because we actually, as an association, just spent our first quarter interviewing our members and asking them that very question. And so we worked with a third-party firm and based on the research that we got back and the information, we know that our companies are struggling to fill jobs. And in some cases, the number of open positions is actually impeding company growth definitely struggling with some of those issues. Companies are really struggling with both, you know, attracting employees and also keeping retaining employees. And obviously the employment situation has changed over the past few months mm -hmm. as everything else has. Right. However, companies are still looking at a growing number of retirements as a challenge, higher turnover rates, especially with younger generations where companies then become a little bit hesitant to invest in that initial training with those folks. Companies indicated that they're really still concerned with our kind of poor industry perception, high schools being focused on a college preparatory curriculum, and then kind of a stigma associated 
associated with trade jobs among parents, teachers, and counseling. That's kind of where things are sitting right now. What Mm -hmm. I will say is that we also know that schools are kind of changing their tone when it comes to looking at the value of trades education, especially as college debt has been rising. So that's Mm -hmm. a good thing. You can watch that full interview at oemoffhighway.com. Thanks, Sarah. And I think one of the things that we're seeing is there's a need out there to demonstrate the opportunities that are available in the construction industry and change the perception of what that image is to reinforce the brand as a career path that gives a lot of potential, a lot of growth opportunity. And it doesn't matter whether you're a laborer, a truck driver, a project manager, estimator. There's a lot of different levels out there that are available to those who are interested. I had a chance to speak with Greg Sizemore at the Associated Builders and Contractors, and he believes that changing the perception of what construction is and the type of work that's being done starts at a local rather than a national level. I'd like to play a little clip from that interview with him. Here's what I want to tell you. I believe if we're going to do any significant changes on the image of the construction industry, it's going to happen locally. It will not be anybody standing on a stump in Washington, D.C. or at some capital across America beating on their chest saying that it is, it is, it is, because there's always skeptics to this type of thing. The reality is this. Most work in America today that is done by the construction industry are done by contractors with less than 50 employees. In most cases, there are less than 25 employees. Sure. The truth of the matter is, is that's small business America. And that ought to mean something in the very backyard of every Mr. and Mrs. representative that may be out there representing a constituency. When I get the opportunity to talk to leadership around Washington, D.C. and across this country, if they're looking for me to solve the problem or have the answer, it's not going to happen. Let's take it back to our communities. Let's make sure we're having the conversation with the local PTA about why we don't have career technical education. Because you know what? We are small business, America. We are pumping money into the economy. A successful contractor is making great money going into the economy. Where you stay in it, you pray in it, you play in it, whatever it may be, that's small business, America. So I believe the ground game is local. Obviously, looking at the industry, there needs to be an emphasis on the ability to move directly into a productive career. And without bringing on that college debt load that comes with a four-year college education. For example, going back to the ABC, they offer an apprenticeship program through their network of 69 chapters, and it manages over 800 registered apprenticeship programs where students can come out of what Sizemore calls a positive net value proposition. Here's a quote from him. They have no college debt. They have nothing come out of this other than an education and the ability to pursue their career dreams. I think one of the other things that we're also seeing in the construction side is that due to the pandemic, development of the skill sets that are needed for this next level of construction workforce, we're going to see technology playing a much bigger role in the training needs and to get them to where they need to be. And I'd like to share a podcast clip from Stephanie Schmidt, president of Poole Anderson Construction in State College, Pennsylvania, where she talks about the workforce development issue and how technology plays into that. We've always talked about how different types of individuals learn differently. You know, a lot of educators try to adapt to that, but in the construction industry for a long time have had kind of a one size fits all type of educational environment. And I think this is now forcing us to look at ways to do training where, you know, on site location is not the only way to be able to to educate people. So I think that's one. I think what this has done is taken that down a level to the smaller and mid-sized contractors that maybe think certain technologies are out of their grasp just because of cost, that type of thing. And so there is focus now on bringing that technology, no matter what size your company is, whether you're a general contractor, a trade contractor, or what the COVID-19 pandemic has made people a lot more aware of the benefits of that. So I think there are some things like that that are getting companies and organizations to just take a deeper look at how can I be safer? How can I be more efficient? How can I have a trained workforce? 
And I think workforce development is, is still, even though there are a lot of people that are out there un, and unemployed, there's an opportunity to perhaps attract those workers into the industry. It doesn't change the fact that there are a lot of people who don't have the necessary skill sets. The quickest recovery possible from this is so important to our industry because we don't want to lose people to other industries, you know, such that happened in 2009, around that time frame. We already have such huge shortfalls in the construction industry as far as workforce that uh, we don't want to make that any worse. We want to keep people excited about the industry in the industry and get them trained. I'd also like to share what Greg Sizemore at ABC has to say on this topic as well. Here's what COVID-19 has done. And this is, the, you know, if you can find a, a bright bulb in the midst of all this, where we were traditionally sitting in classrooms of 30 or 40 students, we've now had to embrace technology and take all that education online. And you think about that from the standpoint, how quickly we had to take a right turn or a left turn where we had these big stick and break facilities that we could not use for whatever reason. And now we had to take that online. And our education partners allowed us to do a lot of different things, very unique ways that we could host virtual classrooms, you know, and we can actually do performance evaluations, looking at people through a computer monitor. So just by that one effect, we, technology has had a significant impact on the way we're distributing learning and how our learners are wanting to learn. And frankly, the younger generation coming into industry actually enjoys this better than going to a classroom after hours. And so we're seeing an uptick in people that are interested in their careers now going, hey, I can take this class online on my iPhone, on my iPad, on my desktop, whatever. I, I can do that. And so they can actually pursue their degree just like going to some online university right here virtually. So clearly, technology is opening doors to building the next generation of workers. Sarah, are you seeing a similar type of movement in the manufacturing sector? Yeah, we are. We're hearing that technology, it kind of is and will continue to play a role in especially helping overcome the skills gap and training. It's also playing a part into how manufacturers design their equipment. One of the big things is simplifying the operator cabs, kind of making them a little more similar to what somebody might have in their passenger car that they drive to and from work every day. So that helps to ease operation, which is important, especially as you're trying to get a younger workforce or things like integrating joystick controls that are similar to game controls that many of them grew up on. That all is growing in the industry and ways that they're looking to help overcome that skills gap. There's also been a lot of discussion of the use of augmented reality and virtual reality technologies to help with training, which makes it a little easier and helps to reduce training time. I spoke with a company called Gridraster that mentioned that on the manufacturing side, you know, there's a lot of requests for customization of parts. And so people need to be trained quickly on how to put together those parts and mixed reality technologies like AR and VR can be really helpful with that. And we're seeing that in the construction industry as well, where augmented reality and virtual reality tools are starting to be used, whether it's in training the workforce or being able to better visualize what's happening on a project. It's allowing for those skills gaps to be overcome in a way that perhaps even the online training is not able to accomplish. We're also seeing the advent of simulators to help in the training process. That's another technology that's becoming very prevalent. But also, you know, the advent of artificial intelligence and automation in the vehicles that are allowing less skilled operators to be able to quickly come up to speed in terms of their utilization of that equipment. Many of the functions on machines are now no longer under the control of the operator. It's automatic. They, they don't have to think about it. And it allows them to focus on what they're doing with that job site task. So clearly there's a lot of technology that's going to help in getting that skills level up to where it needs to be. And I think, honestly, there's just that much more to come. So I think we just need to stay tuned. 